Welcome to John Gitz Games. Today, I'll be reviewing Legacy. This is a highly thematic worker placement game where you will be guiding the fates of your family tree through four generations as you attempt to hone the greatest legacy ever known. First, I'll go over the rules, and then I'll jump into my review. Here's the starting setup for a two-player game of Legacy. We see that each player has their own private board as well as a head of family and an endgame victory condition. There's also a single communal board that's in the middle of the table. The first thing the players must do is decide if they're going to begin the game as a matriarch or a patriarch. We see that these player cards are double-sided, and there are differences between these two sides. So let's say that Black chooses a matriarch. They get 9 money, a single income, and 5 random friends. In addition, they get the red disc and they begin with a single income. The white player chooses to play with a patriarch at the beginning. They only start with 5 money, but they have 2 income and 6 random friends along with their yellow disc. And now we can begin playing the game. This is a worker placement game where each player has two universal workers and then they obviously begin the game with a single one-time use colored action worker. And we see there are many of these colors. I'll explain what these do later. On each player's turn, they will be doing a single worker action where they can place their worker on either the four spaces on their personal player board or on an empty space on the communal board. This means there are 10 worker placement spots to look at, so let's start talking about them. It's important to note that a player can choose the same location multiple times on their own player board. However, once a location is taken out on the communal board, no one else, including that same player, can come back and choose that specific spot until the beginning of the next turn. Let's begin by looking at the marriage or arrange a marriage action. Here are the five random friends that the black player began the game with. We see they have four male friends and one female friend. Now, this game is set in the 1700s. It's very heteronormative. If you're doing a marriage, then a man must marry a woman. So since the black player began as the female character, the matriarch, they are going to need to get married to a male to start their family. So let's say the player playing black choose to begin the game by marrying Pascal, an officer in the Cardinal's Guard. The first thing that you do is you look at the top and you see that it costs minus two. This is effectively the dowry that you are having to pay in order to make this wedding happen. Next up, we see this one income bag here. This means that my family is going to increase their income by a single bag, so we shift that up. And finally we see this here, it says gain one yellow disc. So I would take a yellow disc from the central supply and put it into my player area. Finally, we will take the happy groom, paired up with the happy wife, and we need to make a baby. So we go to the top of the children's stack and we draw the very first card and we see they have a boy. There are two different sides, this is the young boy and this is the adult boy. So it starts off as a child. We go ahead and put the child directly underneath them and that fully evaluates the marriage. The other option you have for the marriage space is to arrange a marriage where you essentially make a marriage happen in the future for your current children. So for instance, the player playing black here now has a little boy. They could try to arrange a marriage with a woman in the future. Next up on the player boards is have children. Now I fast forwarded here and I gave white the starting marriage and a child. So let's say that white chose this option here. Now we choose a couple in our family tree that have less than three kids. There are a couple cards that break that rule, but these are not any of them. So we choose this couple here. They only have a single child, and they just simply have a child. You either draw one from the top of the deck, or you can lose one victory point to choose the sex of the child, so you would keep drawing until you drew the boy or girl that you were looking for. So they would draw the top card from the deck, and uh-oh. So this is called a complication of birth, and it says lose the mother or the child. So this is pretty terrible, it's the 1700s and bad things can happen. So either the baby or the mother dies at birth and it is the player who is playing's decision about what happens. However, in either case, you keep this complication at birth card in your player area to show that in this generation you had a single one of these. You're never allowed to have multiple of them, you just discard new ones within a single generation. Next up is ask friends for money and this is really simple. By going to the spot, you either take $2 and nothing happens, or you can take $3 but lose a victory point because people start to look down on you, or you can lose a victory point, lose a friend from your hand, and take four points, showing that they've just completely left your circle of trust because they're quite upset at you for borrowing all that money. And the final option on each player board is socialize. This one's relatively simple as well. You see you can spend zero money to choose one new friend from this face-up stack. You could spend one money to get two friends, or you could spend two money to grab three friends from this area. It's important to know that once you take friends from here, they do not automatically refill. It's also really important to note that if you ever take friends so that there is a single one remaining, you are forced to take that one as well, 
at which point the bank would be empty and we would then refill it with five new friends. Now let's look at these six options on the communal board. And you'll notice that there are multiple colors on them. So this is where these one-time action disks come into play. You can always use your universal workers to go on any of these slots. However, this yellow disk must always only be placed on one of the yellow slots on the communal board. Likewise, this red disk must only be placed on this red slot right here. So let's start talking about these options. The first to discuss are these two yellow options. We have acquire a title and contribute to the community. They're both yellow, so two yellow actions can be evaluated in a turn. However, this one only applies to these three over here, and this one applies to these three over here. Once you use this spot, you simply pick one of the three available options and you spend the cost in the top right corner to grab that specific contribution, or in this case, title, and you add it to one of your couples in a family, and then you get some bonuses. For instance, this right here is simply a church donation. You spend three money to the bank, and you get to draw four face-down random new friends. You take the card, you associate it with a couple, and now there are less options for future turns. Next up, we have the Fertility Doctor, and in order to go to the spot, you have to lose one friend from your hand, as well as $2. But the big bonus for the Fertility Doctor is that you get two children for doing this action, as opposed to the single child you get for the one on your board. Next up, we can buy a mansion. This costs us one friend, and it costs you three bucks. But when you take this mansion, you flip it over, and it's really nice and pretty, and we see that there are two shields on it. So if we were to do this and put it for this couple over here, we would then push the shield track on our player board up by two. Next up, we have Initiate Adventure. This costs two friends from your hand, as well as one victory point. When you take this, it gives you a money bag. So you could put this down on a couple, they own that, and it would increase the overall income that you're gonna get at the end of each turn. And the last option is Undertake a Mission. This costs you one friend from your hand, and you simply draw the top card and look at it in secret. It's kind of a quest that you are trying to fulfill. This only happens if you have at least two nobles in your family. Once you do, you can spend one money to the bank and you'll get three victory points and you'll force every other opponent to slide down once on their shield track. Now you might be asking yourself, how do you know if you have nobles in your family? So let's take a look at some of these friends. We see in the left hand side of all these cards, there are little icons and these show the kind of work that these specific friends do. So this is the noble icon, so they don't really do anything. This is the artist here. This is a politician. We have a scientist here and here is an artisan. It's also important to note that there are little flags on the right hand side of each of these cards and that is the nationality of that specific friend. Once it's a player's turn and they choose to not take another action or they simply can't, then they pass. And once every single player has passed, we are going to skip to the next turn. We look at the turn track and we shift it down once and we see this little gold money bag icon. So we shift this over here and this signifies that each player now takes money equal to their current income level. So the player playing black would take three money and the player playing white would now take two money. We would then shift this over to show that it is now turn two, and the starting player token would shift over to the other player in a two-player game, or just clockwise in a three to four-player game. At this point, we would take all of the workers off of their different playing boards, and these one-time use discs would go back to the main supply. So now let's talk about what happens at the end of a generation. We see that the first generation only lasts two turns, the second generation lasts three turns, and the third generation lasts four turns. So at the end of the second turn, we'll shift over here, everybody will take their income again, and then we'll go to this spot right here, and you see that it's kind of a star with a little shield on it. At this point, each player gets victory points equal to their current shield level on their player boards. Now we'd shift it to the next spot, which has a star and a little card on it. This is the symbol for children. So at this point, each player is going to get victory points equal to the number of children they were able to make in a given generation. So now the generation is over, and we move this marker over to here. We see that there is a little disc. What that means is any of these one-time use discs that were not used by players, they get discarded and each player gets one new one randomly. We take one of each type, we shake them all up, and we give them out to each player at the beginning of each new generation. The other thing that happens is the contributions and the titles are generation specific. So these level one cards would go away and the level two cards would come down. Next up, we shift our marker down and we see a little tourney card here, and that is when all of the children grow up and any arranged marriages happen. So we do this in player order, so we see that why does the first player here, they have no arranged marriages, so they would simply rotate all of their children over. And now it's this player's turn, their little boy grows up and immediately gets married to Eliza the Poetess. So we already got the money, we did that when we arranged the marriage, and now we get to do the rest of the card. We see that we get to take one face-up friend from the pool, so Eliza has friends that get added into our family. But then we also see that you gain one green disc if you have any other 
British friends in the family. So you see a little British symbol right here. Obviously, at this point, we don't have any of those, but this is the reason why those little flags matter. Many of the friends in the game and many of the missions in the game will let you do certain bonuses if you have given nationalities amongst your family tree. The last thing we have to do is this happy new couple needs to have a baby. So we draw the top card from the deck. Oh, it's a little girl. They go ahead and place this down here, and now you officially have a grandchild. It's important to note that in this game, you're going to have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, which means your family tree is probably going to get quite large and use quite a bit of table space. We see that at the end of the ninth round, we do the typical thing where we go here, we score shields, then we go here and score victory points for each of our children in that generation. But finally, we score victory points for that special card. One of these, for instance, is the Madame de Pompadour. We see that you get nine points if you have at least seven children during the third generation. But here comes the tricky part. We see this bottom area with the red border. These are optional end game scoring conditions. Now you only activate these by using unused mission cards, but it's a little more complicated than that. During the first generation and second generation, when you use this undertake mission, you take the card and you look at it, it's got a quest and you try to fulfill it. However, once you're in the third generation, which is almost half the game, you don't actually look at the cards anymore when you go to undertake mission. You simply take the top one and you leave it face down in your player area. And for each of these face down missions that you choose on turn six, seven, eight, or nine, you get to activate one of those two optional end game victory scoring conditions at the bottom of your card. So if I had done this once, I would get to choose one of these two end game conditions to evaluate. Or if I had done it twice in turn six through nine, I would get to evaluate both of these. Once you add all those up into your victory point track, you see who has the highest, and that person is your winner. If there is a tie for victory points, then the person with the most shields on their player board wins the tie. If there is still a tie, then they share the victory. For my review of Legacy, I'll be covering each item of this list, starting at the top and working my way down. So let's begin with the positive points. And the first of these involves how well the theme is woven into the very mechanics of this game. If you get rid of theme entirely, you have a solid playing Euro game. It's fun but you add that theme on and it just elevates and multiplies the enjoyment that you get out of this game because every single nook and cranny everywhere you look is strong thematic tie-ins. You look at the rule book and there is a paragraph over every single ability that you can do explaining the theme. <laughs> it says, this is why you might lose a friend or two. This is why you might gain some prestige here and the reasons why because you're aristocrats and oh, you got a new mansion and they're pissed off. They wanted that mansion too, so they leave. Or, oh, you had to go to the fertility doctor. Well, that's not a very good thing for nobles to have to do, so some people are going to look down and you're, you're going to lose friends. That stuff just makes sense to me. Also, when you just see the mechanic of building that family, it makes a cool engine, which I'll get to in just a second, but it just feels like you're building a legacy. The game, name of the game is Legacy, and that is what you have. At the end of the game, you look down, you see your great-grandchildren, and you say, wow, I built a legacy. You look at all the different nationalities of all these different people, and that's interesting and thematic as well. You have uh, the largest percentage of people is going to be the French, but there's all sorts of other nationalities in, and a lot of them are like racists. There are some that just give you negative points for having specific other nationalities in your family. There are many that synergize with that same nationality in the family, which kind of makes sense. You marry in a Russian lady, and she's really happy to see that her um, uncle-in-law and her grandfather is also Russian. It just kind of adds in this thematic context that just makes so much sense for this game, and it just really works. And positive number two has to do with how the engine building in this game was designed. I feel like the designer could have gone one of two different ways. One way is you build this big pyramid and everybody bounces off each other and they all, this ability does this and every time you do this, 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 and this procs, and they could have done that and I bet they were incentivized, they probably wanted to do that because that sounds cool, but that would have made your brain melt. That wouldn't work with this humongous pyramid of people that you're building. Instead, they built an engine building game of one-off cards. Pretty much everything that you do, you place it down, it does it once, and that's pretty much it. The only ongoing effect you get is uh, what they do. Are they a noble? Are they an artisan? Are they a scientist? And what their nationality is. But there's no real complicated factors to that. You can kind of look around and be like, oh, I have three nobles, I have four Russians. That's pretty easy to look at the stuff in the past. You're constantly thinking about the future, like pushing forward how this is all gonna build up. Which cards in your hand might synergize together in a one-off fashion. And I think that does a really good job for keeping downtime lower than it potentially could be. And I think it's just kind of a refreshing thing. I haven't played that many games that have you building this big colossal thing 
through a series of one-shot effects. It seems like most engine building games bounce off each other all like crazy. I'm glad they didn't do that, and I think it makes sense from a thematic tie-in as well, which I already talked about a little bit, because it's like, you know, time is moving forward. The, the people behind you are not necessarily alive all that time, so it's just adding to the legacy that you had a scientist in the family who happened to be Russian. Not necessarily that that person is still there doing stuff for you, so I just really like how that works. Neutral number one has to do with those special action tokens that you get in the game. I think it's a really cool idea. This is a worker placement game where you only have two workers, but then you get all these one-shot color-coded actions that can only do one thing. That's neat. Uh, the issue I start to have with it is kind of how they were executed. They, the first thing is you get them randomly uh, as you enter new generations. In the beginning of the game, you kind of get it randomly based on your starting player character, but then later on, you're just drawing them out of a hand and, oh, congratulations, you got the fertility doctor, you're super happy. Or, oh, looks like you got the build another mansion one. That's not very interesting. <laughs> it's going to be worth maybe a couple points to you, depending on the time of the game, but it's not going to be helping you build your engine. And I, there's a lot of like, ah, oh, oh, kind of let down moments when you're getting those randomly. And I feel like it was just a missed opportunity. I feel like this is a great mechanic that they have in the game. Like many of the friends get you new, the, new uh, special action tokens when you marry into the family, and that's great. I feel like the designer felt that he wanted these actions to be used more often, like maybe people weren't marrying often enough to make use of those. So here you go, you get some random ones at the beginning of the turn, but uh, I just wish there was maybe they were on more people. So you got them through more marriages, or maybe they got passed out based on reverse turn order or something, which I'm going to get to in just a little bit. I feel like it was a bit of a missed opportunity to fully flesh out that really interesting idea of the special action tokens. Neutral number two has to do with the touchy subjects that this game inevitably brings out. As I mentioned before, there's a very strong thematic connection, and the theme at this time is not the greatest when you think about it from a human equality perspective. You know, in this game, you can have complications during pregnancy, and guess what? The mother or the child has to die, and you need to make that decision. It makes a lot of thematic sense, but it's kind of dark, uh, and you can you can try to laugh it off and oh we'll remarry and whatnot. But it's not the happiest thing in the world when you're thinking about complications of childbirth. Also, you have an asymmetry between genders in this game, and I think the game is designed in a way that treads this line very well. However, it doesn't change the fact that when you marry men into the family, you gain income and you lose money because you are paying a dowry <laughs> to marry the wife. Or when you marry women in the family, you get money instantly because of dowries. It also seems like a lot of the women get you more friends, or as the men get you more prestige, and from a thematic standpoint, this makes a lot of sense. Where in the late 1700s, you are all nobility, you're trying to build, you know, pompous family lines, everybody is sexist, and it's kind of terrible. That being said, the game does a really good job of having a large diversity of these two genders. You have beautiful women, you have ugly women. You have beautiful men, you have ugly men. And uh, there are some men that you get money for paying because, well, they're very low born or they're just ugly. And there are some women where you have to pay money because they're very low born or they're ugly. And that's, ah, man, I mean, it thematically makes sense. But there's no getting around the fact that it's kind of uncomfortable if you really want to think about it that way. And it might be an issue for you. It has not been for us. In fact, if anything, these things have just increased the enjoyment I've had for the game because of that thematic connection. But it's just, it's just something you should know about. And now let's move into negative point number one. And this has to do with the way turn order is evaluated in the game. Turn order, specifically whoever goes first, is very important in worker placement games. You know, pretty much by definition, uh, you want to go to a spot. Once you go there, nobody else can go there. That's a big deal. One spot's probably going to be better for you. And getting that initiative to get there is very important. But in this game, at the end of a turn, you just pass the starting player token to the left. And that person goes first. And if everybody had the same number of turns being the starting player, that would be forgivable in my opinion, but it's not. In a three player game, that's fine. This game always plays nine turns. Each person is gonna be starting player three times. In the two player game, that's not the case. One person is gonna be starting player one more time than the other person. And in a four player game, you're gonna have somebody who is gonna be starting player less than other players. And I just don't like that. I have not seen this lead to imbalances in the game. Like I haven't seen the fourth player always lose or the first player always win. But it doesn't get around the fact that I think it's just a missed des design opportunity, almost like a bad design opportunity. Uh, in games where you have a bunch of rounds and then you clear off and reset and you go back in, I feel like they should always have a mechanic for moving the starting player token that is not just clockwise around the table. Uh, there are lots of different things you could do. You could have it be the person with the least amount of victory points or the person with the least 
kids, or there's just lots of things you could do. Or you could potentially have it move clockwise, but have a reverse draft on getting those special action tokens. I wouldn't like that as much, but even that would be better than the way the game currently evaluates it because there is no balance for being the fourth player in a four player game. I just, I don't like how that happened. And like I said, it has never broken the game, but every time I play it, it just does not sit well with me. Negative number two has to do with that end game scoring card you get at the beginning of the game. I like this in general. Like, this is great in board gaming. It's face down. Nobody knows what it is. It gives you a direction to play the game. It also adds to replayability because it's going to be different from game to game. What I dislike is that bottom part of the card where you activate some uh, end game scoring conditions based on mission cards that you've drawn. Now, if you remember the way this works, for a large portion of the game, the entire third generation, when you activate the mission space on the board, you take a mission, you don't even look at it, and you just put it down in your player board and you say that is going to activate one of those two things on my little card. And that works, but man is it clunky. It's awkward to teach, and I also think it gets rid of a really cool aspect of the game, which are those missions. You know, the, a large portion of this game is that third generation, and the entire time you draw a mission card and you don't even look at it. I love looking at them and seeing what the conditions are. Oh, if I have three scientists in the family and I pay two bucks, I put this down and you know everybody has to give me a scientist from their hand or something like that. Those are cool and they add variety as you're playing the game. It makes that an interesting action. And of course, it is nice unlocking these end game bonuses on your card, but I just, I feel like that is clunky. That could have been done in a way better way that maybe it could have been the number of missions you completed would activate some of these things on the bottom or just something. I feel like it was a missed opportunity. It's awkward. It's the hardest part to teach in the game and I don't like it. And now let's talk about replayability. I honestly don't have that much to say about it because I feel like Legacy has a very standard amount of it. It's not bad, it's not particularly amazing. Uh, at the beginning of each game, you get that uh, victory point card that's hidden, and there's a few of them in the box, so that adds a little bit of variety. Those missions add a little bit of variety, although, like I just said, you don't get to use them as often as you'd like. Um, and you're gonna get through that entire friend stack pretty much every game. And since they are almost always face up as they go, after pretty much one or two games, you will have seen every friend in the deck. But that's okay, because as you're building that big pyramid, that big legacy of your family, it's going to play out differently every single time, because it's all about how the order of that those friends come out and the way you can make them all kind of connect up, synergize, and work well together. So this game, I could definitely see getting quite a bit of play. It certainly is getting quite a few requests to play, so it's not getting stale anytime soon. Okay, let's talk about player count now. The game plays two to four players, and I've played all those different sets, and it works with all those different settings. I'm going to start with a four player and say that I would not necessarily advise the four player game usually, because a couple of different things. The first thing is downtime can become an issue. Analysis process is not a big deal in this game, but late game when you have that big pyramid and you might have 10 people in your hand and you got 20 money, there's a lot you can think about. And I've had situations in the four player game where you, you're, it's really not getting back to your turn as fast as you like. So that's not ideal. Also, as I mentioned in that negative, the way the turn order works in this game is not very favorable for a four player game because somebody is going to have less turns being the start player than somebody else, which is really not great. And lastly, this game takes up a lot of space. You're gonna need a pretty large table to play a four player game because that pyramid of people gets big and they have this over here and this over there. I've seen some people get compact down, but it gets hard to play the game in that setting. So I'm not saying I'll never play four player again, but it's definitely not my favorite. And now for the three player game, I would say this is probably the best player count to play for a couple different reasons. The first of which is pretty simple it gets around that starting player issue that I have. Every single player is gonna be starting player three times throughout the game, it's nice and equal, that's good. Also, it is a good balance between downtime and tension because downtime is not as bad as a four player game. There's only two people between your turn and your next turn, uh, but also you have enough people getting in the way. In worker placement games, you need that tension of, oh, is somebody gonna to get to that spot before I can get to it? Can I do this thing first? Because it would be good to do that later and you have a good balance of that in the three-player game. Uh, shifting into the two-player game, it's definitely good at two-player. I liked it quite a bit, but again, you have that starting player issue, which I'm not gonna rehash again. Also, there is definitely less tension. There's just less people going out there onto the board. There's pretty much always people fighting over the fertility doctor, but beyond that, it's definitely more open. I, I like it two-player, I really like it three-player, and I could be convinced to play four-player if I need to, but it's definitely not ideal. 
In conclusion, I've been really impressed by this game. It might seem like I've harped quite a bit on some of the negatives that I have, but that doesn't get around the fact that that first positive, the great mechanics to theme integration, is so big, it kind of dwarfs everything. It's the first thing that I tell everybody, and it's the most important thing that I tell people about Legacy, because I think it is rare to see a solid Euro game that also has such great theme. Like you feel like you're doing what the game box tells you you're doing. How many games do that? You feel like you're building a legacy. You feel like, you know, burying off your kids and then marrying off your grandkids. That all makes so much sense. That little game of figuring out the hand management of which cards to play in what order, that's all solid. All of this is just so solid, which I think is probably why I talk so much about the negatives because those were a little bit glaring, like a little surprising. So much of this game is elegant, streamlined, and just really well designed, and then these couple things just kind of seem like thorns, like, oh, weird, why, why was that done that way? And they do not get me even close to not recommending this game. I recommend this game entirely and wholeheartedly. I just have a little asterisk that the turn order is a bit weird, and there's a couple little weird clunky things down there. I wish they had streamlined those, and if they had, this game would be like a beyond glowing recommendation, but as it stands, I definitely recommend it. Of course, like I mentioned in the neutral points, there are touchy subjects that you want to think about as you're playing the game. It might affect the age of which the people you are playing with is, or if somebody is just particularly sensitive, you need to keep that in mind. But man, it's just a really good package. I've, as I said, I've been very impressed with it, and I recommend you give it a shot. If you'd like to see more in-depth board game reviews, as well as full game playthroughs and vlogs, please subscribe to my channel. Also, if you'd like to become more involved with the channel, you can directly support it at patreon.com slash johngetsgames. Thanks for watching.